We are back. Uh, technical difficulties out of the way. If you're just joining us or if you're coming back, welcome again. We are joined by the one and only Jonathan Breck. Jonathan, who, um, from what we're learning, helped mold and create the Creeper from the Jeepers Creepers franchise. And uh, if you have questions, we want to hear from you guys. Drop your questions for Mr. Breck in the chat and, uh, you know, let us let him know how much you love the franchise. So, Breck, welcome back, sir. Thank you. It's good to be back again. We're going to go back to the last question because it was it. we're learning so much. And it's fantastic hearing that you as an actor, not a lot of actors get this, especially in today's industry, had a big hand in molding sort of the creature you got to put it sounds like a lot of your own input it mm. sounds like there was a lot of collaboration involved and the the creeper and from what you're telling us um it sounds like you know you had a big influence on how they were going to write this this creature going forward uh, can you talk to us again about that first shot and then uh, what you did right afterwards with, you know, uh, giving your full attention to the camera uh, from the point of view of Trish and Derry as they're driving down the, 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 the highway. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and, I, and I'll just start by saying, you know, you know, it's like no great performance. Most of them all start with that all of them start with the script, right? And great characters. Right. And I, I, I mean, I have to say, you know, Victor, I mean, obviously we, I owe it all to Victor's imagination and creating a great character for me to build on, which is really kind of what I did was built on what he had, had written. And we had had a great relationship and the best, you know, when you make a movie, you hope for a great collaborative experience doesn't always happen that way, but this one was a special experience where um, we were kind of in each other's heads. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, he, he, we, we were thinking a lot of the same things and, and we would just add to it. And that's when it really got fun. And that first scene that you mentioned, Ted was, was kind of like that. Um, and just for our audience out there, what we're talking about is the very first scene in the very first movie where the uh, Trish and Derry are driving by the church and they see the creeper throwing, you know, what they think are bodies down the pipe. That was the very first shot that I ever shot in any creeper movie. And I just remember, you know, obviously being nervous before the shot, my first shot. Um, and Victor gave me direction before the shot. He was like, okay, you know, we're going to be on the process trailer here, point of view of the kids driving by the pipe. And we're just looking at, the, we're filming the creeper and they're seeing him and he's just dumping bodies down the pipe. And that's it. Right. And so, you know, we did a couple takes and, you know, cut, cut. That's great. Awesome. We got it, you know, kind of moving on. And I was, I just had an instinct. I had something I want to do and I, I, I don't, can't even really explain it. It just felt like, you know, the creeper would know that Trish and, and Derry were driving by. He'd probably know who they were. He may, maybe even he was expecting them. I think I mentioned before. Um, so he would want them to know that he knows that they're there. Um, because he's all about fear. He's all about, he knows he's, I want one of those two. I don't know which one I want yet. Matter <laughs> of fact, I don't even know what part I want yet. That, that's um, actually like one of my favorite parts of the, the first Jeepers Creepers movie, especially is the randomness at which, um, the victims fall throughout the movie. Yeah. You know that these two are being chased the whole time, but there's a lot of time they don't seem really in immediate danger. And it appears as if the creeper, is just messing with them along the way. And it it was very different for a movie of that time, especially uh, usually who you expect is going to die is going to die or something along that fashion. But it, you guys took a very different approach to how the creeper killed in this movie. It was at random. It, the people who you thought were going to go weren't going to go right away. Well, it's kind of a hallmark of the creeper movies. I know you've noticed it's like, the second movie, you never expect the young, blonde-headed 
boy to go in the first 10 minutes of the movie. But hey, man, <laughs> that's what happens in a creeper movie, you know? Yeah, I love the randomness. Come on, you know? So, uh, yeah, so it's we, we kind of prided ourselves on, on doing the unexpected um, with that's those movies. And so... Yeah. That's a great way to put it. The the unexpectedness of it all. Um, because it's not a slow burn, meaning like the action sort of comes pretty quickly where the plot starts evolving almost immediately. But the fact that we never really know what we're dealing with until like halfway through the movie <laughs> yeah. is incredible to yeah. keep people guessing. And I also want to say like, this came at a really great time. Like Scream had already done three slasher movies and those were clearly not getting any better in quality. And so I know what you did last summer, like all everything was like slasher, slasher, slasher. It was great to have a change of pace and in such a, a very raw sort of gritty type feeling. Cause it's not a big elaborate story. It's a couple of high school kids driving down this highway yeah, brother and sister place. trying to work out their differences on the on a road trip in a chevy malibu or whatever <laughs> it was yeah wrong and- place <laughs> wrong time and they get curious and things just start like immediately sort of tumbling downhill after that and it's such a great pace of a film and it's shot extremely well like there's so many things i could say and go on and on about it i want to know from you um we talked before the show about all the you know the costume the makeup the prosthetics was it a very long sort of process for you because this was early 2000 or possibly late 1999 and uh you were wearing it looks like a full Head to toe, it had to weigh hundred pounds. Suit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that 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 latex is lighter than you think until it gets Ooh. full of sweat, and <laughs> and then it gets kind of heavy, which it always did, especially in Florida where we were shooting. But the makeup oh, process back in two thousand, which is when we shot that first movie, you know, it was much more laborious. It was uh, anywhere from five to seven hours a day wow. to get that that stuff on. Um, and the open face, you know, the one where the creeper's head opens up. I mean, that was the seven hour day. Um, and that was before you went to work, you know, so you, right. you logged seven hours before you went to work and then, you know, they, they got the most they could, they could out of me once they had the makeup on me. So I'd work 10, 12 hour days. So it, it was pretty intense, but I really used that whole makeup process. It's kind of a, a way to drop into the character you know, you see yourself that because the creeper people don't realize this people come up to me all the time. It, it shows. And when I do appearances and stuff and they talk about the mask, it's not a mask. That's a build. That is a makeup, you know, like for instance, around each eye was five separate pieces, you know, they were all wow. glued on individually and blended and then painted over by hand every single day and the reason they did that is we we talked about this a little bit earlier is because they wanted to do it the right way that's how they used to do prosthetics right so that when i did something everything in my face registered it wasn't like i'm wearing a mask and you don't know what i'm doing under that mask right it's literally like skin like if you were to look at the creeper hand i'm putting my hand up next to the camera here if you look at the creeper hand you would see Jonathan Breck's veins in the creeper hand. I mean, that's how detailed it was. It's a process, right? So, so getting back to the every day when I would sit in the chair, I would watch myself disappear like piece by piece, you know, and the more I disappeared, the, the deeper I would go into the character. So well, that's, that's cool. You're almost kind of leveling up. That's right. So, that's right. And, then, and then you get to this ultimate form once you're all put together and you're in character and you're able to hit, the set and, and deliver that sinister attitude that, that the, uh, the creeper carried. It, it's, it's awesome. I wanted to know, do you have, um, was there dialogue at any point for the creeper at any yeah, point? Did you have lines in the movie or I had one line, man. I had, had one <laughs> line, uh, when I was at the cat lady's house with Eileen Brennan and we actually shot it. And, um, 
And then Francis personally himself was like, you're not fucking talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, who's going to the... tell him he doesn't know what he's talking well, about? Well, right? I mean, there is a thing of, um, of villains being more, more – uh, intimidating if they don't speak. He's right. He was right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, right. I would agree yeah. with that too. But I, it was just funny to hear that there may have been dialogue, and then like you're sitting in there. Oh, so am I delivering lines today? Am I just, um, you know, sort of physically acting through these scenes? So if you I, knew how just, many hours, if you knew how many hours I thought about what the creeper should sound <laughs> like with his one line, <laughs> yeah. I put more work into that one line that never made it on the screen. So. <laughs> That's amazing. Are you allowed to say what the line was? What were the words that we were potentially going to hear? Ted, I think it's somewhere on the making of. I think, you know, the the uh, special edition of the first DVD has a really great making of behind the scenes. And that's my additions on that. A bunch of things are on that. And I, I could have sworn that that they put an out, outtakes on that. And they might have put that line that they cut on that. I, I know it's somewhere. It, no, it, and I watched it today, and I'm trying desperately to remember what it was. It was a funny kind of like, oh uh, yeah, yeah. It was like a, well, he, I had just I'll, like get back, bitch, kind of line or something. It was something I'll, like that. <laughs> I'll I'll show you where. Well, he he pushes. I don't know if you remember, but he pushes Eileen Brennan's face up to the screen, and he's hiding yes. behind her. The creepers hiding yeah. behind her, and then you hear this. You know, you know, he's smelling behind her and then you see him kind of creep out from behind Eileen Brennan. And he's looking at Derry. And he's like, she don't smell too good, Derry. <laughs> oh, that, 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 he throws <laughs> Eileen Brennan and he goes after him. You yeah. know, that's the line, you know. Wow. So, yeah. And that was around the part where she was like, get off of my lawn, you know, right now. Yeah. With my babies. Yeah. yeah. My babies. Exactly. Yeah. And all I, that, I feel yeah. like uh Lake Placid kind of took that character from the uh, the lady in Lake Placid who had the, the lake house with the alligator. I thought that they kind of based a little bit of that character on her, kind of. But anyways, this is a, that's a Dude, deep cut. Eileen Brennan, <laughs> you know, she was a treasure, man. She was so great. And, and of course, this was later in her life. She died not long after she made that movie. But, uh, you know, she, she was so entertaining. She was totally, she was yeah. out there until the camera went on. And when the camera went on, Eileen Brennan was locked in, man. She oh was she was a true pro. It was a real honor to work with her. Well, rest yeah. in peace and, and cheers yeah. to Eileen Brennan. That's sure. for sure. Legend. She was fantastic in just that, that little part. You're kind of wondering, like, sh should we be afraid of the creeper or more afraid of this? Lady with all these cats, you know. Was... She, she she almost became the protagonist for a minute. It was like, all right, maybe she'll save us from this uh, from this thing. Uh, One she... of my favorite parts of that first movie actually was the cat lady scene. Oh my god, yeah. it's it's <laughs> so chilling, and there's not a whole lot to it. There's just a lot of nuance, yeah. and yeah. it what's what's still great. Again, I mentioned like you can try and call it a slow burn, but you see all these things you're left to your imagination on what's going on in that house. Yeah. And it's such a great way of playing with the tension and the drama. I mean, again, I was, I was in high school. I was just driving. I was like, this is the perfect time to watch this movie. And uh, it, it just had so it carried your imagination so much at so many points in time I, it was just incredibly well written um for such a small for, it was for such a small you, and idea. i can't tell you how many times that truck i mean that truck obviously was a character of his own too oh for sure and i can't tell you how many times i'm out somewhere and somebody says it doesn't matter where i am i mean i could be in omaha nebraska i could be anywhere and somebody comes up to me and says man i was driving home from work the other night and there was a truck behind me and I swear that was the creeper truck. And I nearly crapped myself. Mm -hmm. I hear that all the time. So yeah, uh, speaking oh, yeah. of that scene, and um, yeah. speaking of maybe things you can or cannot talk about, let me know. All right. there, there's an uh, Unsolved Mysteries episode mm -hmm. that is very, very similar to the scene in which the, the truck goes around. And this Unsolved Mysteries was based on a particular 
uh, murder spree that had happened. And I'm wondering if there was any tie in whatsoever between that and the, uh, the Jeepers Creepers film. You know, not that I know of, and, and that's the truth. I, I've actually heard from people. I've heard several different stories, not just that one that you're talking about. The unsolved mysteries is one I've heard several times. I've heard, heard of other things that people thought that it might've been derivative of. Um, and not that I know of, um, and I and I kind of know, you know, where the 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 birth of the character came from, and I can tell you, it wasn't from an unsolved mysteries. That's that's so, okay that you keep those yeah. secrets. I'm totally yeah. fine yeah. with that. I'm not going to try yeah. and pry it out of you. Uh, I, was, I was. I was. Jack. I was, Does that ring any bells? Spring Hill Jack. No. Mm -mm. Mm. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, all we're doing is, is we're taking care of internet rumors. So now we can go and, and we can fact check everybody who uh, is, is giving all these uh, stories. As we're the debunking Spring Hill Jack, huh? <laughs> I've never heard that one, Spring Hill Jack. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good I got, story. Look I got a question for you, Breck. The Creeper had so many very unique corks. He whistled, the way he put on his hat, made sure it was nice and tight on. Um, the way he sort of was very easy going about his daily habits, uh, was that something that you also helped collaborate with uh, the director on doing, or was that in the script? What did you think about that? Yeah, it was just the character that we created together. You know, it was just, just, I can't, I can't tell you how much instinct kind of took over with that character. I just felt like he had a little bit of swagger to him. Absolutely. You know, uh, just he just needed to have a little bit of swagger to him. And uh, also, you know, I felt like, you know, I, I really did approach the character. It's interesting. I was never really a huge horror fan growing up, which um, surprises people, I think. And, and when I first got that movie and I remember the very first interviews that I did, I remember being kind of self-conscious about uh, you know, journalists asking me, you know, who are your inspirations, that sort of thing. I was like, God, you know, I don't really, I wasn't a huge horror fan growing up, but I really approached, I think in the end it helped me because I didn't have any preconceived notions of anybody that had done anything before. You know, I just approached him like another role, right? And I thought about, okay, this is a guy that spends 23 years by himself with his right. victims. And I thought a lot about <laughs> You know, look, yeah. he's a he's a craftsman. He's a craftsman. He, he like he he in a way he kind of loves those victims, you know, and takes care of them. Um, and so I thought a lot about all that dynamic. Um, so I think it just gave some interesting dynamic to who he was, you know, and Such the and the fun he had with it. Right, twenty three years, twenty three nights, and the fun he would have in, in knowing. Uh, having to be pent up for that long and then yeah. not wanting to just uh, playing with your food a little bit too. It, exactly. Like a yeah. cat a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. So. We, we have some questions piling up in the chat. So we'll, we'll start asking you some of them. Uh, okay. Joseph wants to know, did you take anything from the set home? Ooh. Uh, that's a good question, man. I, I took, um, they wouldn't, I couldn't get it. I didn't get any of the costumes. Um, um, unfortunately, but I did get yeah. throwing stars and I did get uh, a dagger. And uh, what else did I get? Um, a few little odds and ends and things like that. But they they archived most everything as they do a lot of times on movies. Um, and so I didn't I didn't get much. I've got on my office wall. I'm, I'm looking at uh, some of the throwing stars right now that I've kept. <laughs> um, but that's about it. So. That's fantastic. Well, we told the fans there was going to be a giveaway. We thought you were going to give away a screen news costume. <laughs> they they were prepared for that. Anyway, you tell you what, you tell your fans <laughs> to give me their address, and I'll come pay them a visit, and uh, I'll hey, bring them a little something. All right? <laughs> whoa, so. I don't know. Whoa, whoa, yeah. <laughs> oh man, the uh, the creature design is just so intimidating. I I want to say and imagine that. Um, Justin Long and I, I forget the the actress's name on the show uh, on the movie who played Trish. Were they Gina sort of Phillips. Gina? Was was she? Yeah. Were they both extremely like terrified to see you on the set? Did you did you sort of play 
the role when the cameras weren't rolling to sort of maintain that um, that chemistry between the you know the killer and his prey? Well, I didn't want to know them at all, so I did. I never met them while we were shooting oh. the film. Matter of fact, I was never around them when I wasn't on the set, when I wasn't in full makeup and in character on the set. Cause I didn't, I didn't, first of all, I thought it would help them not to know who I was personally. Sure. I didn't want them to know who, what I look like. I just wanted to be a complete enigma. I thought it would help their fear and then vice versa. I didn't want to like them at all. <laughs> I didn't want to have any sort of impression yeah. of them at all. So I, 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 Victor and I concocted this plan to keep me completely separate from the kids the whole time. So I didn't even meet them until the rap party. Actually. Wow. You, I feel like everything you're saying is just so well thought out and planned. Like the approach, <laughs> the approach was done. Like it was executed like perfectly. I just, I love this. Uh, Cause it feels like it's such an insignificant thing to most people. But if you, if you spend the time, you take it extremely seriously then yeah, it, it probably makes a world of difference. And it makes you much I more visceral. Did. Visceral. I, I think it, did. It, it, it made a difference for me. And, 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 and I know I've heard them say it, it made in interviews, I've heard them say it made a difference for them. Now, it made for a hell of a lonely experience for me because <laughs> oh, yeah, for three man. months I was by myself you in, poor guy. in the retirement <laughs> village in Florida. Nobody to drink red wine with. It, nobody awesome. drank red wine with exactly. <laughs> so it, was, it was a lonely experience, but uh, I'm, I'm glad I did it. I think it added something to the interaction between the creep and the kids. So. Heck yeah, it did. Heck yeah, it did. You did an awesome job, man. I'll say. Uh, Joseph also wants to know, and feel free to <laughs> be a little coy with this one. Was there anyone you didn't like working with on the film? I can't imagine, but. You know, I, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't even, you know, my recollection of that film is 20 years ago now, right? It, it, right. My recollection, it was all about making the best film we could. We didn't really, I didn't really get caught up in liking somebody or disliking somebody or any of that shit. I was too busy. I really was too busy, like being oh, immersed in, in what yeah. I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get into any of that politics. And, and plus, you know, it was really one of my very first movies. So there was a little bit of hell. I'm just happy I'm here. Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> to be completely Solid. honest with you, H you know, yeah. on the first movie, you know, so I didn't really spend a lot of time or energy, you know, having any ego or disliking anybody about any of that stuff. So definitely. Uh, it was awesome. And you, you were coming through it during an age of, um, cause we saw it with the screen movies where, like sort of these horror genres were starting to like self-identify almost in a meta way of kind of like making, poking fun at themselves. And oh, yeah. the, w the way that Jeepers Creepers did it, they did that too, for sure, during this film. And, and you know, you were on set, so you know. But it, the way they did it was just a little bit different. And the, the randomness at which certain things happened was, I, you know, it's a cult classic. It's It's... It's a really, really good film, and I, I watched it all the way to the uh, the third movie, and I was I was very excited to see that there was another one coming out. And yeah. what what was your thoughts on the on the new one coming out? Oh man, I hope it's good. Um, you know, I didn't I I I don't know if your fans know or, or my fans know or not, um, but I'm not going to be part of the fourth movie. Um, they wanted to go a completely different direction. So they didn't involve anybody in the first three movies. They didn't involve me or any of the other cast or the DP or, I mean, not the stuff. I mean, nobody. They wanted to go a completely different direction, which, of course, you know, I have to respect at the end of the day. And, and ultimately, um, you know, I wish them the best. I hope it's a great movie. Um, you know, the fans deserve that. Um, would I have done another one? Man, I'd have done 12 of these. You know, <laughs> I would have. They were so much fun to do, and I enjoyed the character. I loved it. You know, it was an honor getting to play the role. So, yeah, I would have loved to have been a part of it. But at the end of the day, I again, I honestly, I just hope it's good. I mean, it better be good. Yeah, right? I mean, they have not, some shoes to fill. They have some shoes to fill. Yeah, but thank big, you. Big shoes to fill. If it is good, that's great because then people will go back and watch 
the earlier films and figure that out. I, I realized that with Predator. I didn't watch Predator that much uh, growing up. But when I watched the recent Prey movie, now I've kind of been really interested in the first few Predators. So I, I think that you'll have a similar effect with some people maybe seeing this and going back and wanting to see kind of the origin uh, of where it came from. Well, and, and I hope so. Um, now, it won't be the origin. Uh, you know, it's their imagining, right? Uh, sure. Uh, nobody was in. I mean, and that's kind of the one thing I, I have to tell you that I lament about this is you know, Victor wrote this character and wrote this series with, you know, we kept everything, his origin, like you alluded to earlier, Ted, and, and a lot of those things is a closely guarded secret, but the idea was always to release a little bit more with each movie. Absolutely. Right. So as we make more movies, you'd see more about where the creeper came from and his evolution. And so we had a lot of storylines. I mean, the plan was to make 10 of these. Yeah. Wow. Where we would, where we would release more and you'd get more about the creepers origins. And so, you know, all that, a lot of that's already developed. Victor sure. already developed a lot of that. Um, and so it's a shame that we're, we're never going to get to, or probably will never get to share that right with the fans. And so now this is a completely new creative team that they've taken their own slant on where they think he came from and all that kind of stuff, but it's not our or Victor's vision. Right, in any right. Way. So I do lament that because I know what that was, and that was fucking awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I lament that 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 our fans who deserve it won't get that. But uh, but again, I mean, I hope it's it's going to be different, and I hope it'll be good. So, yeah. C correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, there was, you know, you were a part of the third film. But the third film, did it change? It was at one point going to be mm. called Cathedral, maybe have a different storyline altogether. Is this right? It's completely different. Are you yeah, I'm glad you asked that question? Let me, are you let allowed me go to say anything? Are you, are you okay with saying anything about what the original concept was going to be? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was called Jeepers Creepers Cathedral. And so if you can imagine the creeper lair that you saw in the first movie, ah, and yes. imagine uh, that like a hundredfold. Ooh, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just give you an idea. It's like at one point we were going to shoot and we had, we had the Jeepers Creepers three movie set up probably three or four times over the years we were doing them. Right. And one time, the closest time we ever got to it before we actually made it, we were even crewing up. We had locations and one of the locations was in New Mexico. And the creepers lair was an old turquoise mine, abandoned turquoise mines. So just imagine being in a mine and as far as you could see, having bodies on the wall. You know, that was Jeepers Creepers Cathedral. It was incredible. Wow. And, but it was, but it was a big movie. You know, it was a $25 million budget, right? And so by the time we finally got to shoot the third movie, people weren't spending 25 million bucks on horror movies anymore. You know, they wanted no. to spend 4 million, right? So, you know, the reality was Victor had to rewrite Jeepers Creepers 3 into a much smaller movie. And so, you know, he turned it on a dime basically and was really smart and figured out the whole trick of putting three between one and two. Um, and, you know, people tell me all the time, ah, you know, the third movie didn't really measure up like to the second movie or whatever. And I'm like, if you knew the real story behind that, I mean, our budget was three million on that third movie. The first movie yeah. I spent 10 million on, right? So that gives you some reference, some frame of reference there. So, you know, we only had three million and all of it went on the screen. I mean, that three, yeah. probably more than any of them was a labor of love. I mean, we were all working for less money. You know, it, we just we were just happy to be able to make it, you know, so. Absolutely. Sure. And we're just still glad to see you back in the, the creature, uh, the creeper outfit. Yeah. And it's still, it's still great because it was able to build on the lore. They, you know, they did great things by adding like booby traps to the vehicle. And those yeah. were like incorporated heavily. It's, they're they're not these wild crazy ideas you know it's it's very simplistic in nature 
but it adds so much to the lore of this creeper that he just thinks about all these things. It's just fantastic, in my opinion. I'd love to see a crossover film eventually with uh because they did the Freddie and Jason thing. I think adding the creeper into that kind of a mix, a, a sort of crossover, you know, um, villain versus villain type of movie would be really good. Would you be open to anything like that in the future? Oh, of course. Sounds fun. You know, I, I know <laughs> right. those guys now. I'd like to I like to stand toe to toe with Robert or or uh or one of those guys, you know? Yeah. So it'd be fun. I, I don't know. Back to something you said earlier, Ted, I think that, you know, you don't have to go crazy elaborate. If you tell a good story and you take the time to do it right, the fans will reward you and, and the movie will stand on its own. And I think that's what, you know, it's, it's like anything else, right? It is not, not just in the horror genre. If you, if you, it's, it starts with the story if the story's solid and you do it the right way and you take the time and spend the money to do it the right way, you know, you got a shot at it being a good movie that lasts. Definitely. Um, and it's not popcorn shit, you know, yeah. that, that people are making just to, to make a buck. You know, it's a re, it's a movie that'll hopefully stand the test of time. So that's yeah. kind of what I appreciate about how Victor made these movies is he, 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 he loves movie making and he's a writer too. And he, he first was a fan, you know, and he made great movies, you know, and it shows when you watch them. So, yeah, they stand the test of time. Um, they don't require a whole lot of uh, sort of understanding, uh, meaning like, you know, the horror genre has definitely evolved over the years. What was scary 30, 40 years ago really doesn't hold up a whole lot these days but jeepers creepers that first one is just so immersive of a film like i when you watch it on a big screen how i watch it the first time it really sucks you in and you're just you're you saw it in the theater first time you saw it Ted? first time i saw it i did saw too it in yeah the theater. oh that's awesome i'm glad to hear that man and i i knew nothing about it i mean that's the best way to go into a film isn't it is to know Absol nothing about it just walk in like that yeah absolutely and it the the title you know kind of throws you for a loop because you don't know exactly what to expect and the creeper itself is so intimidating because unlike michael myers who's somewhat slow you can outrun him freddie you know you just can't fall asleep and he can always overpower you jason don't be by a lake but the creeper is like unstoppable. Like you really don't have any choices to make to really protect yourself. You're almost just at his mercy at all all times. Yeah, there's something terrifying about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no. You can't get away from the creeper, man. If he wants you. So, question is, what he wants? What does he want? You know, yeah, that's the question. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, we'll leave you with, with one last question, and it's really just what you want to say to the fans. You had this uh, opportunity so far. I, I think there's still chances that we could get something. You know, fans were really intrigued when uh, Gina Phillips came back at the end of the third one. So I feel mm -hmm. like there's always going to be hope. Um, but just what does it mean to you to continue meeting fans of the franchise, to continue hearing about um you know everything that they just love about the entire um trilogy what does it mean to you to keep hearing things and continue oh, come on. and continue <laughs> continue hearing about the legacy of the creeper my apologies no no that's fine um hey man i appreciate you asking that question because it it's the most important thing to me you know when i made this first movie. I remember finishing up the movie and, and then I don't know who it was, but somebody said, you know, you're probably going to get the opportunity to go out to like some of these conventions, right. And meet some fans. Right. I, was like, I was like, what are you talking about? And literally this was really before Comic-Con had become a big thing. And be before, you know, you had the opportunity to go meet fans. And I didn't really even know what they were talking about. And then I got invited to one and then I got introduced to horror fans. 
<laughs> and horror fans are obviously freaks, but the best freaks in the world because Absolutely. they were so loyal, man. And they appreciate everything, you know, as an actor, they appreciate every nuance you bring to a character and every, tw you know, twitch and turn or, you know, they, they value it and appreciate it. And, and, and so I, I, it's been such, so cool to meet fans over the years. Um, you know, you do a lot of movies and other genres and you never really get any exposure to fans like this, but horror is different. You know, you get Absolutely. to get, venues, let me get out and rub elbows with the fans. Um, and I'm just humbled truly because people appreciate it so much. Um, and it means a lot to them. And so, it, you know, it's, it's, you know, sometimes it's a little overwhelming because you don't see yourself as, is that right? You'd have sure. to be insane to see yourself as that. Right. But um i really appreciate it everybody that i meet um stories that i hear from fans about um you know going to see jeepers creepers with their mother who's passed away now and how it mean, meant so much to them or every halloween they get together with all their extended family that they haven't seen all year and they is it one of their rituals is they watch jeepers creepers and that's that's there's nothing fucking cooler than that yeah, you know, I really feel that way, you know. So I would just say that uh, I really appreciate the support over the years, and um, uh, you know, I that's that's it. That's all I can say is I'm I'm very appreciative, and uh, and uh, hopefully I'll get a chance to do more for him. We'll see. You never know, you know. So you never know. Yeah, Breck, we want to thank you for for joining us. Of course, uh, man. We'll let We'll let you get out of here, and uh, we are not ever going to give up hope that <laughs> we will see you back behind the steering wheel of that insane truck or wearing all that prosthetic makeup again. <laughs> I feel like there's still hope. There's still a devoted fan base to this franchise. A crossover will be great. A crossover will be sick. Maddie wants a crossover. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Perfect. Brilliant, brilliant. But no matter no matter what, Breck, I want you to understand and know that uh, we appreciate um, all the effort, all the time, all the work you put in to creating what I consider to be, honestly, like I said, the last great original monster creature that we've we've had in cinema. I think that was probably the last original concept. And um, you've you had a huge hand in that, so we thank you, sir. And also, we thank you for joining us today and uh, joining us on this interview. Appreciate you very much. Absolutely, guys. Good luck with the show. Love you guys. Take it easy. Appreciate Bye -bye. you. Take it easy. All righty. How great was that? that fantastic. That was uh, fantastic. Joseph Appreciate Joseph too for putting all that together. Uh, you know, and um, Breck was fantastic as a, as a guest. Um, so many great tidbits, so many great insights to the movie, and um, just a legacy. He created a legacy. I'm not even like exaggerating about that. Yeah. So much thought went into the creeper. I think it's fantastic. I actually need to show AJ uh, the first Creepers movie because I don't think he's seen it. So uh, that's one of the things I'm going to be doing this week for sure. It's the first movie I ever saw Justin Long in, and he had a pretty good, solid career after that movie too. He went on a quite a bit of a tear. And uh, it, it's, it's great. It's that early 2000s. It's a specific brand of horror film. It was kind of right after those screen movies and, you know, horrors trying to find itself again, you know, and they brought back a, a, a creature horror, which we hadn't had in a very long time. And so it's, it was an honor for sure. It's blessed to speak with him. And uh, what else? Uh, uh, I, that's, all, that's all I got to say. <laughs> it oh. was everything. It, it really was. And it was, like I mentioned, it was a great time because we talked about it earlier like the scream, the best scream movies were already like 
in the rearview mirror. And um, I know what you did last summer, like tried to extend their franchise and that wasn't working out. You know, the slasher film genre, they started just copying one another and it wasn't exactly. going anywhere. It happened because of blockbuster falling. So the that type of film where you could release movie after movie after movie was extremely popular during the time of being able to go and rent the movie. So like, let's say you just watch six, then when you see seven in the story, you're going to go get seven. When you see eight in the story, you're going to go get eight. When Blockbuster sort of fell and the video rental store fell, you kind of lost that genre a little bit because they sort of existed in the in the VHS realm and the, the movie rental realm. Uh, even you know what I mean, and so we kind of lost a bit of that genre with the fall of video rental stores. I think. Yeah, I I would say so. And um, like I said, that was a great great time because I I was in high school. I was probably a sophomore junior at the time. Uh, probably a junior when that came out, but it was like a really terrifying film because there was this creature that you couldn't do anything about like he was going to plow through through people sometimes literally you know an entire police station (laughs) he went through an entire police station of uh, cops with shotguns and rifles like nothing so yeah yeah, it was uh quite quite uh, a time it was a great memory i'll never forget watching it the first time it was it was quite an experience yeah, and there was uh, a lot of movies coming out at that time that weren't that good, like uh, like House of Wax, you, you know, like the early 2000s. So there's, there's some horror movies that didn't quite land. It, Jeepers Creepers at least established a new lore. It established a new character that some of the other ones didn't quite capitalize on. I thought it was one of my favorite of the early 2000s uh, horror films. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you to Breck. Appreciate you very much. Uh, It's a fantastic interview. Learn so much. And, you know, like it goes, it's it's really unheard of. I mentioned um, actors these days, they don't get a lot of time to collaborate with directors. They don't get a lot of time to kind of put in their input, you know, to, to kind of help mold these characters and creatures. I've been talking to voice actors over the last couple of weeks and they all are kind of saying the same thing. Um, there, there's no input. There's no collaboration whatsoever. They sort of show up to an audition uh, online these days, and the director says, "Ah, the voice is not what we're looking for. Thank you for trying, whatever." And that's it. Yeah. Rather than getting some feedback, working on it, coming back. Um, so to hear that he had an opportunity to sort of help develop this character and they loved it and they ran with it you know um Mm -hmm. i feel like he inspired the movies going forward and everything they're gonna do in this fourth one which comes out very soon um he they're probably gonna take a lot of inspiration from elements that he incorporated so um again thank you to breck for joining us and thank you for the the creeper franchise that we've had so far you had a huge hand in that and we i appreciate that immensely i'm a big scary movie guy and uh that's one of my favorite franchises just because it's so original and it's so well done um yeah well we have some other stuff to talk about don't we (laughs) yeah and who are we sponsored by today uh i don't know if you can guys can tell but (laughs) we're wearing the geek cast merch I mean, uh, come on! Colors, as you can see, look at this. The print quality Christmas is Christmas. insane. <laughs> it looks good. I know Joseph wants one. Number one fan, Joseph. You should get some merch. Red Bubble. What's what's the uh, what's the after the Ford slash? Uh, count Countdown City Geeks. Let me pull up the link. Bingo bongo. Bingo, bongo. Uh, for those of you in the chat, uh, if you want to pick yourself up a GeekCast t-shirt or merch item, there's a link right there. I'll also pin it to the top. And uh, man, yeah, fantastic stuff. And I promise we won't match moving forward. This hasn't been on purpose. We're going to talk hasn't. about that. Yeah, we don't want to yeah. do this. <laughs> I probably, we'll, we'll have to, uh, you know, 
kind of work around that in a, a little bit. I want to bring up our next topic, Ted. Can I do that? I, I want you to, yes, because I know you've been hounding me about this all, all week. So you guys have been following the Geek Cast for years before I was ever even a part of this. In the short time that I had even been following, I know that Ted is a big DC fan. And yet we haven't got a Ted Kalunga rant on what is going on in the DC universe. And I thought on Ben Affleck's birthday, his 50th birthday, with the trending news of Make, make the Batfleck movie, which is obviously kind of a joke. We know that he said he didn't want to do it anymore. Although we want him to come back. He was a great Batman. Where are you, Ted, on the DC universe? Can we give that to the fans today? We can give it to the fans today, but um, I don't know if you're going to like my answer. Um, I, I, anything you say, I, I like. I am on the fence. I am concerned. I have some concerns. Originally, I thought there was going to be nothing but sort of positive, uh, well-made decisions going forward. Um, because as we both have been talking about for years, uh, DC, but more importantly, Warner Brothers does need leadership. They need someone to help make good decisions. And I feel like not everything being done today falls in line with a good, sound decision. Yes, things are being done with regards to um, saving money and budgeting and whatnot. And that's all well and good that you will make decisions regarding the business side of things. But it feels like it's overkill at this point. Um, we are now wondering not only what movies or TV shows that uh, were planned on getting done are getting canceled, but now established TV shows um, we're now wondering if those are going to get canceled. And that worries me a lot. We're talking about Young Justice, which just ended its fourth season. Uh, Doom Patrol, which just wrapped its fourth season. Things like... Um, Superman and Lois. Superman and Lois, you know. What is going to be considered too much money to continue? I mean, Superman and Lois does not have a small budget. You can tell by the VFF, the VFX work that they do. And so I am now concerned that the canceling of items will, will not stop. I don't think they're going to stop with, with what they've done. It may continue on. Blue Beetle, which we all want to see in theaters. Of course, yeah. I do not want to see that get the axe. But they didn't talk about Blue Beetle during their Comic-Con presentation for Warner Brothers in July. Just like they didn't talk about Batgirl, and we saw how that turned out. So... If you ask me what are my thoughts on Warner Brothers in DC right now, I am concerned. I have some faith that everything going forward will be, there will be a lot of time, effort, thought into everything that does get greenlit going forward. Every movie that comes out should be a blockbuster movie. Um, everything that they decide to do with regards to the cinematic universe will be big, elaborate ideas. And that's what I want. It, enough messing around. Like, these, this is DC Comics. We should be going all out. Uh, this is Black Adam. DC. Uh, Ryan says Blue Nettle. He means Beetle. Blue Beetle won't get an axe. They change it from... HBO released to theater. Yes, I remember that, uh, that they changed it to uh, all that could change, Right. And but so my, th all my thoughts on it now are like, I'm kind of with Joseph. So you, you mentioned something earlier. You said that DC, every movie needs to be a blockbuster release. I think they agreed. And I, they, think, they that's what, out, I think that's what their head is at right now is that everything needs to be over the top, but, which but the sounds rock. good in theory. The Rock is not what we need. You don't, you don't want to add The Rock to your superhero universe. He didn't even wear mm -hmm. hair. 
He didn't even bother to make his ears pointy. He's not going to talk in an accent. Black Adam is from Egypt. These, <laughs> he, It's just going to be the rock and a cape. It's, and it, you know it's going to be that. I know you don't like to go that far with it, but no, I'm going to I'm pull fun, the Joe I'm, Garcia here. I, I get it. I get it. And I'm, I, I'm actually on board with you, uh, on board <laughs> with you. I am more looking forward to Pierce Brosnan as Dr. Fate. I'm a huge yes. Dr. Fate fan. You but, we're Dr. Not, Fate. but we're not world building now. And I, I, this is something I alluded to in a video we made earlier this week about Ezra Miller. There's something in that Flash movie they were intending to world build with. And now they're, they're looking like it's not going to be able, they're not going to be able to do it. So we're looking like Aquaman might even just be canceled. Amber Heard and Aquaman 2. We don't know how much, how far that's going to get pushed back. All of that is still kind of in the Snyderverse. Like they, they have zero identity right now. They haven't, they started in one with the Batman movie with Robert Pattinson, but the second, the second one isn't even greenlit by the studio. So that won't be out for years. What are you doing? It feels. Where are they? It feels like the Batman. I'm actually a lot less concerned with the Batman because Matt Reeves is such uh, a big name for Warner Brothers. He did the first two Planet of the Apes films. He's such a big name that they're just giving him the time he needs and they'll get to all you know the legal stuff regarding green lighting, the film and all that. Uh, re- with regards to Ezra Miller, this was something that was talked about last week, and I was going to wait until we heard some news. News just broke. Uh, the 29-year-old Flash actor uh, has now... It's been announced that he will seek treatment for complex mental health issues. So <laughs> yeah. he is he is seeking help. And this was something that uh, fans of his and maybe even people that maybe were not fans of his uh, were all saying. Uh, he actually made a statement. And I, I will go ahead and read this now. Or should I pull it up? Maybe I'll we'll just pull it up. Here's a statement from Ezra Miller. He says, I want to apologize to everyone that I have alarmed and upset with my past behavior. I am committed to doing the necessary work to get back to a healthy, safe, and productive stage in my life. As speaking of stage, that's staged. That's not a real. That's not a real comment. You know, it's not. What ha- d- you- WB and DC are trying to therapy wash this film. They're hoping if they can some sort of resurrect Ezra Miller's uh, status just even a little bit, then maybe they can release this movie without having to cancel it. Because then it's, it's going to cost them so much more money to try to rebuild the universe after this. It's I don't know. I mean, I, I, God, God bless him. I hope he goes to therapy and I hope he does get better. But that's not a real statement. That's that's the studio trying to therapy wash uh, their movie. So it, people don't hate Ezra as much when it comes out. We we can say that, right? And it, it may very well be that. But you can't, as a studio or a PR team who works for the studio, you can't not do it. Like there's just common sense steps to take. And regardless if it is legitimate or not, that's still the next common sense step to take. It very well may be that he is going to seek treatment. And you and I probably both agree as long with right now, it's pro <clears throat> it's probably necessary. I, right? I agree. I, I and I one hundred percent. God bless necessary. him on his journey. I want him to seek help and be a better person. If the things he's accused of are true, I am all for that. Go seek help, brothers, kings. We gotta, we gotta stay up and we gotta stay uh, keep our mental health right. I am all good with that. But to act as if that sort of is going to somehow make the flash movie relevant it's not going to happen it's going to get black backlash it's going to get backlash if they release it on streaming it i think they have to 
at this point, draw a line in the sand and say, okay, this is where we're going. This is where we're going forward with. They don't have a Kevin Feige. They, and, and maybe they don't need to exactly copy Marvel's formula, but they need a Feige type character who is sort of moderating this universe and kind of keeping everything in line a little bit. DC needs to pick a, a runner. They need to They need to get somebody who can get in there and keep these actors in line a little bit and also keep the directors in line, make sure the studio is involved and the funding is good and that, you know, we can keep pushing moving forward. They have a great deal with CW. They don't have to yeah. do a streaming service. They're in with cable. So you don't have to pay the premium to watch the stuff on uh, a streaming service like you would with Marvel. There, there's a lot of things in line for them that can go well. I just, they, they need somebody in charge who's making decisions and who is respectable and that the people working for them respect. I see you, Ryan. He says uh, The Rock is a brand. They are thinking of making money. Dwayne Johnson, if you just putting Dwayne Johnson in anything, you're guaranteed, what, three, four hundred million dollars? That's just what it is. But um, you, you sold out the brand then, though, you know? I got you. Uh, Ryan, Ryan also says he also has to disagree. This is what he's always complained about. Finally, a direction but may not be popular for everyone. It did. De- it depends on if the direction is overkill. So I probably just joined us like a few minutes ago. I was talking about, uh, well, you, you've, you probably heard some of it. Where does it stop? Like Doom Patrol just finished wrapping season four. It, we don't even know when it's going to come out. Any, anything that's on HBO max right now, we don't know what, the the future holds really because uh, from what we're hearing from all the experts all the industry insiders there won't be an hbo max in probably a year or less um and are you really going to put some of these shows onto a platform labeled discovery that you know remains to be seen so we'll wait for all that to happen uh ryan also says wb don't care about Ezra at this point. They just want to break ties. It's a done deal. You might be correct. You might be correct. Uh, if there's a chance that he gets better, you know, the optics look good. The movie makes a billion dollars, which it definitely has the potential to do that. Ben Affleck's in it. Michael Keaton's in it. It's going to make some money. Um, Supergirl's in it for crying out loud. You know, things could definitely turn. I, you know, the entertainment industry, the general audience, it's a uh, general audience is a weird animal. They can change their tune uh, any number of ways. Nobody really cared about Ben Affleck coming back until we saw a video of him on the set of Aquaman 2. And then suddenly, <laughs> it's the biggest story out there, completely no. overshadowing anything that Warner Brothers did during San Diego Comic Con. So it, you don't know sometimes all it takes is a little spark, uh, kind of like uh, Giancarlo Esposito, who we interviewed last weekend. Um, he wants to play Professor X. He said it in a number of ways. The Internet ran with it. Um, but to us, me and Matt, he's actually trying to gain some sort of leverage. And it's not leverage on Marvel. He's trying to gain some popularity points. The studios pay attention to what happens on social media. You may think they don't, but they absolutely do. And that was a huge eye-opening um, weekend to Marvel, who, if they were on the fence about having uh, Esposito as Charles Xavier, now they are strongly or maybe just considering it even more because of how quickly that story took fire. Yeah, it's just to me like DC is just they just um, DC. It to me it just seems like they're like a, a grocery store. Like they have the you came to buy lettuce, they have lettuce and they have uh, tomatoes and they have onions and they have things that you can buy. Uh, Marvel right now is acting more as a farm. They're growing lettuce, they're growing tomatoes, they're growing onions. And you can buy them at the at the edge of the street. They're making it very easy to access their characters. They're making it very easy to uh, dive into the world. They're they're growing from the inside, 
And it looks like DC is just kind of shelling out properties that they know people spend money on. That's why I have a problem with the Rockets Black Adam, because that's exactly what I'm talking about. They're just taking a property they own a license to and and selling it to as many people as they possibly can without actually growing the universe or the characters or or setting it up in a way. I mean, could you really imagine Dwayne the Rock Johnson across from was it Zach Levine who plays Shazam? They're not going to look good. Zachary Levi. Zachary yeah. Levi. They're not going to look good. That's not going to work. <laughs> the The Rock is going to completely overpower the Shazam character. Like nothing they have really is cohesive, and that's why, to me, the, this Flash movie, I want to see it, and I want to know what's in it. it. It has to be great. It has to be really good because they're they're sticking behind it, and I think it's it's incredible. Uh, Ryan also says Peacemaker is safe. That's all that matters to him. Yeah, you're probably right about that. I don't. Again, like I said, Matt Reeves is fine because he's Matt Reeves. Any projects he has going on, other than Gotham, the Gotham spinoff TV show that got the axe that had uh, freaking uh, Penguin yeah. in it, and that yeah. got the axe right. So, you know, which would have been incredible. I it feels like it would have been. Um, <laughs> the Reeves verse is getting a little smaller. And then uh, James Gunn, anything James Gunn wants to do, um, he's pretty much going to get done. So there is a second season of Peacemaker on the way. And then also Idris Elba is going to be doing something. He announced uh, just a few days ago that he probably wasn't supposed to say this. He has something cooking is what he said. Something real nice or something. It looks like he's going to be re-entering the something universe. Great. He was what it felt like he was leading into that. He's coming back. Bloodsport will be back. Yeah. What they're planning, what they're going to do. I have no idea, but if you ask Idris what they're going to do or what he wants to do, he said multiple times on multiple occasions, he wants to take on the man of steel blood sport versus um superman Cal- kal-el superman yeah. yeah and 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 anytime that you can have an actor of his caliber in your arsenal that's incredible because he could have easily went that marvel route there's a lot of actors that you know it, he he well he uh, was in marvel he's a uh, high oh, yeah but yeah but he no wanted to, he likes his blood sport character he loves the blood sport character. yeah and i think that it, having that type of investment from your actors I mean, I give me more all day. I'll take Idris Elba any day of the week. Put him <laughs> in any DC franchise. Absolutely. You know what also came out today? Um, I know this isn't DC, but it's still interesting, and I want to get your thought about it, is um, another Saw film in the franchise. Is it too much? Are you? <laughs> yeah. Do you want more? Tell me what you think. Can the answer be yes to both? Yeah, I can actually. I'll yeah. go with that. <laughs> it, is it too much? Yes. Do I want to see it? Yes. <laughs> I will. I will always watch a, a Saul movie. It's going to be interesting how they take the character of Saul. I mean, the the gentleman who played Saul has passed away. Um, I forget his name offhand, but so maybe they can put a, a new little spin on it. I, that was when horror kind of, that's when we were talking earlier. It's kind of funny that we did the Jeepers Creepers uh, interview early on because this is when like horror kind of took a turn and it started to become a little bit more grotesque. That was the jump scare. It was just something really gross. And so Saul kind of kicked that off, you know, <laughs> uh, that kind of era in Hostel and there was a few other films, but I'm always going to love a Saul movie. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to want to see how the puzzle unfolds. I'm going to want to see what kind of maniacal madness comes from from these puzzles. I, I'm always down. I'm. It's one of those things. I do like the franchise. The first two films, I, I would say I love. I love them. I yeah, even the one really with uh, Donnie Wahlberg. I thought I thought it was extremely well done. The last Saw movie. Also known as Spiral. Oh boy, I was not yeah. engaged with that one yeah. whatsoever. I I, I just didn't I just didn't care. And it's not I don't think it's the fault of any one person, any two people. I just think that the story wasn't um as compelling. Uh you know, it was sort of like they tried to make a Saw movie, but uh, it just felt 
so different, so disjointed. Um, I don't know what to say. I wasn't engaged with it whatsoever. And I by the end of it, I was just, I don't care. I don't even remember what happened. I think uh, I think people died like like they normally do in Saw movies, but Yeah. Um, I agree. Well part of I the, don't know. the I don't know if I want to see this next one. Yeah, because the last one was like it was trying to like tell a story, but it was relying on the old um saw tropes so much that it was just it kept going back into those things. But it, it forgot what the first few Saw movies did and we had those jump scares and those really grotesque moments and those those feelings of oh my gosh what am i even looking at but woven in between that was a pretty intricate story you know and the, the last one just it didn't have that to me it just it, it wasn't there but it had the same old saw tropes you know you're watching a saw movie but there was nothing inside of it that was uh, particularly you know interesting to keep with I, I i felt myself disengaged with it as well probably every 10 15 minutes i'm just scrolling my phone but it's just on in the background you know what made the first two saw movies great were sort of the same elements of what made the first jeepers creepers great original concept sort of a a new horror type figure um and you saw a lot of things for the first time in a movie um like the creeper these were all sort of original concepts and ideas that they were you know putting into this story very small details but still original just like breck said earlier he didn't see anybody before him you know whistling while he worked work meaning like killed people uh, mm -hmm. but that that was the creeper saul was a lot like that where there was a lot of new things you saw for the first time saul saw no pun intended but it was brand new concepts that made it interesting. Um, and it wasn't even the killing. The killings were like not the thing to focus on, but just that you had an individual kidnapping, torturing, playing mind games with people. Um, and it wasn't out of enjoyment that he was doing it. He was doing it to sort of teach valuable lessons in a weird way to some of these folks mm -hmm. or to you know take some sort of justice out on some of these people he was an anti-hero in a lot of ways and then there were some of the movies where that concept sort of he was uh, definitely an anti-hero and I, I i pulled similar tropes and it's funny we we're talking about dc before i remember during like uh, the saw one and saw two especially that's how i always wish that some filmmaker or game maker would adapt a Riddler or Joker scenario with the Batman where the Batman is like, as the greatest detective is trying to figure out his way through this maniacal uh, situation. I always wish that there was an interpretation of that. So I always kind of looked at him as um, like a super villain in a way. And that, that's kind of how he was, he was, uh, brought across on screen, even his uh, his character, his demeanor, the voice, everything. Uh, I I just loved it so much. <laughs> I just I mean, I, every time you get me talking about something I really like, I just find that I just nerd out and I'm blushing on camera. Oh, look at you! Oh, look at me! I'm tickled. Hey, did we? I mean, we kind of got that uh, in a way, right? With the last uh, Batman, Batman movie. the Batman, yeah. That's I, I mean, love if, that. I love I'm, that. I'm sure they took, we know they took inspiration from movies like Seven, but there's a little bit of Saw influence in there as well, especially with the sort of the, the headpiece contraptions that he was putting on his victims. I mean, if that doesn't scream yeah. Saw, I don't know what does. Yeah, and I totally agree. And that, that's one of the reasons why I love that Reeve film. And it and I agree it doesn't hold up on the second watch as well as it does on the first one. For some reason, the movie doesn't have staying really? power. Right. It doesn't have staying power with me. I still think it's an incredible movie. My score doesn't change, but it it doesn't hold up for me as much. Like I can go back and watch um like uh the eighty nine the the Keaton films. I can go back and watch Clooney. I can go back and watch Val Kilmer, and I can Clooney, definitely watch really? Christian Bale over and over again. I could watch those movies for days, but for some reason, I I I can't watch the sec even the third view going through of the Batman. I was just like kind of zoned out. I don't know what it is. It didn't didn't stick with me. But I again, I'm ready for number two. I want green light it WB green light it. <laughs> 
Uh, real quick, a uh, shout out to Shape Shift Records who dropped their Ghostbusters 2 16 bit yeah. cover album. Yes, that was a mouthful. Mm. Um, it's fantastic. Um, we shared some information uh, the other day, and they also uh, retweeted all of our, our tweets about the. Uh, the album that they just released. So appreciate them a lot. Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, those uh, guys also, are rad. They're so cool. I also want to say that um, I just dropped the YouTube video for the uh, Sailor Moon panel that I did uh, last weekend at Superhero Car Show and Comic Con. Uh, Linda Ballantyne and Katie Griffin. Katie Griffin, yeah, who were fantastic guests. So much energy. They're so entertaining. If you want to watch that, the link's in the chat. Or you can go to YouTube and search Countdown to the Geeks. Many more panels to come. There's videos I still have to edit. So we're going to be dropping those panel videos uh, probably once every day until they're all out. So appreciate you guys doing that and checking those out. And make sure you follow our TikTok. Ooh, what is that, sir? What is that? It's at Countdown City Geeks. Countdown City Geeks on TikTok. Just type it all in. It'll come right up. We've had a few videos taking off recently. A lot of them from the Giancarlo uh, stuff. We've also had some stuff with Simu Lu and, um, you know, the Shapeshift Final stuff, as well as uh, some things from the car show. So definitely hop on to the TikTok and vibe with us over there because we're trying to get to a thousand. That's the goal. We want to get to a thousand followers. So when we go live, we can also go live to there. So if you guys could help us with that, it'd be awesome. Please, please do. And what could they find on TikTok when they go there? What are they going to see, Matt? Uh, they're going to see a lot of content from the superhero car show and comic con. They're going to see. Probably the greatest video that's ever touched the internet, Giancarlo exposing the fact that he wants to play <laughs> Professor X with Ted Kalunga. Um, we have videos and videos for days. Everything geek culture. We're going to try to put something up there every single day. And if there's any news, then I'll hop on there in my nice little voice and my handsome face and say, hey, guys, here's what's going on today. And you can expect to see that. Who doesn't want to see that, dude? I mean, just go ahead and hit the, the follow button. And, and, and check it out. But we've had some videos taken off recently. Uh, we put in a lot of work into this, but we don't really care at the end of the day. It's all about you guys. So any support that you guys can give, uh, it matters a ton. Lastly, uh, on this episode, it is oh. She-Hulk premiere week. Uh, if not mistaken, the first episode's first episode will drop on Thursday, the 18th. Probably they're, you know midnight pacific time frame like always which uh i i don't like because we have to stay up so late to watch the first episodes and not get spoiled by the morning but uh she hulk i want to know how interested yeah. are you in watching the new she hulk series i'm very excited because this is one of the first properties we're going to receive post san diego comic con announcements so we had um uh, what is it, uh, Mrs. Marvel? Uh, yeah, 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 Mrs. Marvel. Marvel. But that, but that was um, that was ending right around the time we were getting the San Diego Comic Con announcement. So, She Hulk, I think, is going to be our first step in the Marvel universe of sort of setting up this new phase. And I, I think they're going to do an incredible job with it. The first things that I want in the first episode, right off the bat, is let me know how she becomes She Hulk. Don't dra drag that out too long. How does the blood get transfused? Something has to happen with her and Bruce. It looks like it may be a car accident based on the trailer. And then we see a spaceship come down. Okay. So I think we kind of know where, where that might be coming from. So it's, it's, I, I, I'm very, very excited about this. I think this is how they're going to kick off this next phase of, of Marvel and their heroes. I am also excited. Um, you had, they had me at Tatiana Maslany who um, she hasn't had a lot of roles, but um, I've really loved her and the things that she's done so far. So um, as soon as they said she was in it, I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. And then they brought in Mark Ruffalo. I'm in. 
And yeah. then they started teasing us with like Daredevil and stuff. I'm in. Bingo like, bongo. Bingo bongo. I'm ready. <laughs> Let's do this. Uh, say less. So mm-hmm. I'm excited. I also like the tone that they're sort of um, starting out with all the commercials about, you know, call this lawyer and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. She's here for you. In Texas, the thing that we go over the top with the most, <laughs> other than <laughs> other than fried food, um, other than our affinity for guns, um, other than other than yeah, our <laughs> our hell on earth landscape and environment that we call the summers, it's our lawyer commercials. We have some of the most over the top lawyer budget. commercials. Big budget VFX <laughs> explosions <laughs> in the world. You won't find more money spent on lawyer commercials anywhere <laughs> than, than in, in the Texas. state of Texas. Yeah. 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 So the fact that they're sort of they're playing with that a little bit. It's not a lot, but just the fact that they're creating these faux commercials uh, for her her law firm with her as the focus. It's pretty hysterical. You know, we can laugh about it. Uh, yeah. And we can tell yeah. how they're going to kind of set up the story. Like it's a, it's sort of a rough and tumble gal who is is making her way through a mostly male dominated field of the of the law, you know, industry. And and she's she's fighting in court. She's a fighter at heart. She's all this. And then she turns into the Hulk because she uses that spirit to you know help her become a hero. So I mean, we can see kind of how that part of the the story is going to go. But I'm very interested in how they're going to. Um, weave in the comedy in this. I think there'll be a lot of uh, Ragnarok type of uh, comedy throughout the show. I think it'll be very lighthearted. It won't be extremely dark. And they might be using uh, Daredevil to even darken it up a bit. Maybe because he's kind of a dark character, right? So I I think they might use him as a little bit as the yin to the yang to kind of uh, darken the show a bit. But I think she's going to be very lighthearted and is going to take to the transformation well. And seeing her and Mark Ruffalo working back and forth between uh, their characters and he's played the Hulk forever, you know. So it's going to be very interesting to see him develop a a new Hulk and teach her how to use her powers and then and seeing her take that into her normal life. It looks like she's going to be very confident. hero and I'm, I'm excited to see it i also forget that abomination is in this series um Oof. so can't wait to see that oh nine God. episodes they start this thursday the 18th uh can't wait to talk about it for those of you who are just you know new followers of the geek cast um and the geek cast network uh here's the rundown on how this is going to go every week every monday you'll get a show a stream with the Geek Cast, myself, Maddie, Jericho, JC, Joe, uh, the whole crew sometimes. Um, we'll start talking about She Hulk in a week, uh, the following Monday, so one week from today. Uh, tomorrow, the WrestleCast uh, will take over Tuesdays, and uh, they have a big event coming up locally. Um, Thunder Rosa and her Mission Pro Wrestling um, organization, they're putting on Thunder a big Rosa. event. Friend they're of putting the on show. a big event this Saturday. <laughs> Friend of the show, Thunder Rosa. They're putting on a big show in town, and the WrestleCast is going to be discussing it tomorrow night. And catch the WrestleCast on Facebook and YouTube every Tuesdays here on the GeekCast Network. And then on Wednesdays, the Ghost Heads radio show will be taking over the airwaves every Wednesday, bringing you interviews news reviews on everything ghostbusters related and contest, we're going to be doing that prizes. every <laughs> contest prizes all that good stuff <laughs> we'll be doing that every wednesday night so a uh, lot of great stuff coming up um very exciting um yeah can't wait to read into it it's going to be a busy fall might be a very busy winter but we're all here baby it's going to be oh, yeah. busy we got a lot of stuff in the works. We got a lot of stuff already on the books, scheduled, ready to go. But uh, we'll wait till it's a little closer before we start telling you guys about that. So, uh, very excited. Thank you for joining us. Uh, appreciate Jonathan uh, Breck immensely. We had such a great time talking with him. Uh, great guy. Awesome, 
you can just tell about all the work that went into creating those three films and how much input he had on creating the creeper. I have even more respect for him and uh, everybody involved with that franchise now. Fantastic. I'm stoked. It was, it was awesome to talk to him. I, I love those movies growing up. So I'm elated. I can go to bed happy. What about you guys? <laughs> Absolutely. Appreciate everybody in the chat. Joseph, Ryan, uh, Amber, appreciate you guys joining us. And uh, let us know uh, what you guys think about uh, Jonathan Breck. We'll also probably have him back on once the new film drops. And we can sort of, you know, talk to him about what his thoughts are about it. Uh, I'll ask him to see if he wants to do that. But the new film, the fourth film in the franchise, which may or may not have ties whatsoever to the original trilogy, um, that remains to be seen. But the fourth one's coming out next month. And it's an exclusive, like, weekend-only event. Limited theatrical release. So uh, it's not going to be a, a very long... It's not going to spend a very long time in theaters. So it, it's been a very unusual time with this fourth film. Um, nothing has been normal about this release whatsoever. Or any release right now, for that matter. The the yeah. that environment, the dynamic between movies and streaming, and how we get movies post COVID is it's sort of like untreaded water. Like we don't know. Studios are making a lot of weird decisions, so who knows? Yep. <clears throat> All right. For this episode of the Countdown to Geekcast, uh, be sure to check out our panels that we're uploading to YouTube and subscribe to the channel, please. We appreciate that very much. Uh, check out our merch store. We're adding uh, more items to that each and every week. Check out the teas. Don't they look wonderful? Oh, yeah. And uh, be sure to keep checking back uh, with the GeekCast and all the events and all the charity events that we're doing uh, that we got coming up. A lot of things um, and coming uh, down the pipeline, and uh, it's all very exciting. For the GeekCast, my name is Steady. Joining me on this episode... It's one and only Maddie B. We did it, boys. We did it. We did it. Shout out again to Jonathan Breck. Thank you very much, hey. sir. Yeah, thank you. Have a good night.